Welcome to Seattle Sports Union, the best in local Seattle sports coverage. My name is Abraham DeWeese. With me are Richard Michelson and Robert English. Today we are talking Seattle Seahawks football. How are you doing, guys? Pretty good. Doing good, doing good. Wow, you guys sound so excited about today's 16-10 to 10 win. I thought maybe we'd bring up the excitement level a little bit here. Come on, are you guys doing great? Oh yeah, we're feeling it. I'm feeling well, it today. Yeah, I, I'm feeling the okay, sixteen is, to ten win. This is why I'm not a cheerleader. This is why I would have been terrible at being this a cheerleader. Is, this is a score from a hundred years ago, man. <laughs> a score right. from a hundred years ago. A game um, from a hundred years ago. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't exciting. The Seattle Seahawks won, of course, sixteen to ten, and you can read all about it on our great with our great articles. Uh, recaps on seattlesportsunion.com. Also check us out on Twitter at Seattle Sports U, and we are on Instagram. Check us out. All right. Um, yeah, that 16-10 win did look ugly. It did not look uh, did not look like what today's you know modern marvels of offense in the post Don Coryell uh, atmosphere should look like. But it was still exciting. I mean, I, I liked the defense. I liked the brand of defense. That was brought today. I like the way they laid the lumber. That is your Seattle Seahawks. And I actually kind of enjoyed watching the Rams. I, I really dug seeing how Alec Ogletree and Aaron Donald really laid their lumber to the Hawks as well. you got to love this, don't you? you got to love a defense-inspired game. Absolutely. It's what, it's what our division is made, made of, you know? It has been. And it... I think that's the way it's going to be. And that just want to talk a little bit about the defense here because what I thought was that key play of this game, the key play that may change the course of this entire season was an Earl Thomas forced fumble. Robert English, get us up to speed on what happened there. Uh, yes, the uh, the forced fumble was, I mean, actually it was, it was very, it was reminiscent uh, for me of um, the Detroit game uh, what was it, two years ago when uh, Megatron was on his way into the end zone? And uh, I think it was Cam Chancellor that time who knocked the ball free just before he crossed, uh, before he crossed the plane. Um, same thing here. As a matter of fact, I think actually that happened against the Rams uh, uh, either last year or the year before, maybe even three years ago. But uh, the same thing happened with the Rams, I believe, not too long ago. Um, knocked the ball out just before they crossed the plane. It's, I mean, amazing play. Just really goes to show how, uh, you know, just the, the no-quit attitude. Even when it looks like it's a short touchdown, they never stop. And when you play like that, you know, this is how you end up winning games like this. First quarter, that fumble prevented the Rams from derailing this entire thing, Richard. Have you ever seen one play just change the course of a season? Do you think this play could have been it? Uh, this play could have been it. This was echoes of that great Super Bowl caliber defense, okay? I remember that game a couple years ago <laughs> against Detroit. I think it was a Monday night game, if I'm not mistaken. And um, they were interviewing... Uh, Earl Thomas and Sh uh, and Sherman after the game on the NFL Network, and there was a little little bit back and forth about well, you know, basically you guys haven't yet captured what you once had, right? Like as in the window was closing on the Seahawks. They didn't have that greatness in the defense. They didn't have the greatness across the team. And tonight's or this afternoon's uh, effort, the the one play swinging the game absolutely brought. The spirit of the defense, even, you know what, I, I'll say this, even if that is a score, even if that's a touchdown, that effort at the goal line, I don't think the Seahawks were going to lose this game based on that effort. Like that, the, 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 the offense is inept, the running game hasn't gotten off, Russell Wilson hasn't looked like the best version of himself, but um, the defense brought the lumber. I was super impressed. And as far as that one play that swung a season, there was an interception return for a touchdown against the Texans. I believe it was in 2013 when the Seahawks were three and two on the road, getting killed by the Texans early. And they rallied and rattled off. I think it was like 22 straight points. And that was the beginning of the end for the Houston quarterback, whose name I can't remember. Like he became an interception machine after that game. Probably wasn't but. worth remembering. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but, but yes, one play that 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 took them from three and two to four and two. They didn't lose again until the last game of the season. So, Robert, I want to get back to Earl Thomas for one second here. I have 
made a decision. I made a decision in the way I look at this team and who I envision going into the Hall of Fame. I think the absolute unanimous selection, right, you know, first first entry Hall of Famer would have to be Earl Thomas, wouldn't it? Off of this team? You know, I mean, and I, I suppose our, our opinions may be a little bit biased, but um, uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, the, the only thing that I imagine might keep might keep him out from being a, a first ballot Hall of Famer when it's all said and done is just the fact that we're tucked up in the in the in the very top left corner of the country and we oftentimes get overlooked um, for for many things we get overlooked and passed up on all the time that's really our mo that's I think that's where a lot of our fight comes from um, so I mean I, I think that would be the only reason why it wouldn't happen but other than that yeah absolutely I mean I mean who's a better center fielder than than uh, than Earl Thomas Richard you know, I want- I've got a unique perspective here in in Salt Lake City because uh, not only am I in Bronco country, but I'm also in Raider country, Charger country, Cardinals country, Rams country now. Tons of Texans uh, Texans fans, for whatever reason, tons of Cowboys fans, and even tons of Packers and Steelers fans. So I've got a smorgasbord going here. When I talk to my guys about the Seahawks, the one player they all say they wish they could have is Earl Thomas. And it has been this way as long, like, since he broke out, basically. They're like, oh, I wish we had this guy as our free safety. They, Robert, they, they just want him. Robert, do you get the same thing where you're at in Southern California? Yes, yeah. Still uh, a- oftentimes, I mean, I, I hear nothing but, you know, you know, negative things about Richard Sherman. But I hear great things about uh, uh, Earl Thomas and, and obviously Cam Chancellor. But both those guys are the, the two defenders that I hear the most about from, you know, from fans around the league. Def- definitely Earl Thomas and also Cam Chancellor. You guys lived and grew up in Seattle. What, <laughs> what makes the fans here so provincial? Why do we think that our players don't get enough credit? And what makes us want that credit so badly? I, I've tried to think about this, you know, my entire life, and I, I don't get what it is um, that brings me personal satisfaction in knowing that fans in Utah, fans in California, actually know some of our players. Any ideas? I think, um, I mean, I've always felt um, that the Seahawks were just kind of just dismissed always. Again, I think it has a lot to do with our geographic location. Um, uh, you, you just, people just don't really think about us. And even when we, I mean, Seattle has actually been historically a pretty decent team. Um, you know, we haven't always been great like we are now, but we've been pretty decent. Um, uh, you know, uh, even when we went to the Super Bowl against the, the Pittsburgh Steelers, we were largely dismissed. And after the fact, we were largely dismissed. Um, it, would, it only is, is now that people are actually considering Seattle as, a, as a, a Super Bowl contender just about every single season. And even then, if you ask random people around, people are going to say, Seattle, eh, well, uh, you know, they, they always have yeah. to turn their face up at it. Um, but yeah, I think it's just, I think it's, I think it's geography. Honestly, I think it's geography. Richard, do uh, do fans in Utah, do fans in Utah, Richard, feel the same way? Do they feel like, uh, the jazz might get dismissed during those great runs in the nineties? Yeah, they they definitely do. Is it just the struggles um, of being a midtown, midsize town? Yeah, midsize town out in kind of the middle of nowhere and flyover country here. As far as Seattle, I mean, Seattle's a West coast city. It's got tons of like first rate everything except it's not LA but then again there's no city in the world that's LA I mean you look at um the the weight that LA has um it it overshadows every other city on the west coast the only other city in the United States that measures up to it is New York City I mean you when you have the name um just just from what kind of a world thing here when you have the name of a soccer superstar like Cristiano Ronaldo considering a move to L.A., and that's like the only U.S. city he'd play in, that kind of tells you why Seattle was just an afterthought. The other th- reason is championships. Seattle just doesn't have enough total championships. I mean... Well, let's do something about that. Let's let's fix that problem. <laughs> yeah, let's definitely let's, do something about it. It's not that hard, guys. Let's just do it, okay? <laughs> um, from West Coast to East Coast, I want to talk about one. Sheldon Richardson, defensive lineman for your Seattle Seahawks, comes over from the New York Jets on the in the big city, and he was traded for Jermaine Curse. We have seen Richardson with an interception, and yet again today, a couple of turnovers uh, that he's directly involved with. Uh, guys, Richard, 
-hmm. what do you think of Richardson having having the impact? What, what do you think of the impact that he's had, and what we have lost with the potential of what is it? I believe a second round pick and Jermaine Curse. Uh, we've lost nothing. Okay. Right now, as of now. Now, we might give up some second rounder who might turn out to be good. That could happen. But right now, we are the definitive winners of this trade. Jermaine Curse, I love the guy's heart. He went to the University of Washington. He bleeds purple. He bleeds blue. I get it. He's just not that good. Everyone's going to remember him for the NFC Championship winning catch in overtime when he beat his corner like a redheaded stepchild and Russell Wilson threw the best pass he'd thrown that entire game. But that's not the reason to keep him. This is the NFL. We made a massive upgrade in talent and fit. When this trade happened, I like I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that we'd landed Richardson. This guy, this guy is just perfect for Seattle for the defense that we want to run. And obviously he's showing um, that he's really happy to be here. Robert, the immediate dividends that we've seen that's been returned on Sheldon Richardson, did you expect that the day that we signed him or traded for him? You know, it's 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 kind of a it's kind of a hard question to answer because when I when I know about this 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 guy's um ability, I always expect, you know, these guys to come out there and do their best, but you don't want to get too high on things because you don't want to end up being uh, you know disappointed on it. I knew that Shelter Richardson had the ability or had the potential to come in here and do great things for us. Um, and I'm just very happy to see that it's actually happening. Um, you know, like, like, you know, like I said, Jermaine Curse, great guy. Uh, I think he was a, definitely a feel good story. Uh, like I said, came from UW. Um, so it was great to have a hometown guy there playing ball for us. Uh, he, known for the, the catch against the Packers in that playoff game. But let's not forget that it all, um, was it all four of those interceptions that Russell Wilson threw were thrown to Jermaine Curse, <laughs> and two or maybe even three of them were his fault, were, yeah. uh, were Curse's fault. So, um, you know, I, I think he's a journeyman wide receiver. Um, I think I was actually surprised he was on the roster as long as he was. Um, and I wish him nothing but the best. Uh, but, yeah, we, we, we weren't, aren't going to miss any steps with that. I mean, we well, definitely got to upgrade. I want to loop you back. I want to loop you back on target here, though, Robert. Uh, I want to know: Did you expect what? Did you expect Sheldon Richardson to be this good? When I saw the trade, I was happy to see Curse go, but I was also thinking, "Wow, we're getting a guy who does nothing but uh, end up in the headlines uh, for off the field shenanigans." Let's just say it. No, I think I think when anybody comes to Seattle, um, I think they're coming into a system. Where, where, where they're, I mean, you, if you can't succeed here in Seattle, you really can't succeed anywhere, I believe. Um, so I think when anybody comes onto this roster, into this locker room, um, I, I expect good things to come from them. Now, I, do I think he's going to be a, uh, an all-pro this year? You know, you know, it, it, it's, it's in the air. I don't know how that's going to go. It's looking like that. And, I, and did I expect it? I expected him to come in here and play good football. Um, now, it, it's showing so far that he's doing great, playing gr great football. And I hope that continues throughout the rest of the season. This was the number one scoring offense in the league. That is the Los Angeles Rams. Uh, we went into their house. We went into the Coliseum. And we decided that we're not having any of it. We held them to 10 points. Robert, what do you think of the number one scoring offense against our particularly tenacious defense? Well, um, I believe... I believe two things. <laughs> I'm on the fence here. Um, the first thing I want to say, I, I, I first thing I want to say is that maybe the Rams aren't as real as everybody was making them out to be. Um, I had that know, this wouldn't be too, the yeah. first. This wouldn't be the first time the Rams have come out, come out and done some things early, and then you know and faltered uh, middle and late in the season. Um, but I also want to believe that they just don't have what it takes as good as they have been for the first four games of the year. That Seattle's defense is just that good. We don't care how good you think your offense is. You're not going to you're not going to do that against us. Um, so I think we're really going to see what happens the next two weeks or so to see what the Rams really are. But, um, yeah, the best scoring, the highest scoring uh, offense in the league. We held them to 10 points. You can't be mad about that. Um, I like that we actually went ahead and beat them at home or at their home this time because we normally give it up to them uh, at, at their place. Um, so I think we made, really made a big statement today. 
Richard. The passing defense did a number today. They kept Jared Goff 288 yards, and they took the ball away by interception twice. And then there's, of course, that fumble that changed the course of the game at the end. Uh, oh, and the fumble at the beginning that changed the course of the game. Um, mm -hmm. What have you seen from this pass defense? What did you see from the pass defense today? What did you, what did you see from the pass defense in the last couple games uh, that make you think, okay, they figured it out? Or do you think maybe there's still a problem there? I think in general they figured it out. Um, Jared Goff uh, has shown he's got the brains to be an NFL quarterback and the and the physical tools. But face it, I mean most most NFL quarterbacks, whether they're first or third string, have the physical tools to succeed. But he's shown that he can he can make the reads and make the throws and and run an offense. Um, but what the Seahawks have shown me is that they are going to win. They are one-on-one -on -one physical matchups across the board. Um, you know, the Legion of Boom came onto the scene in, in 2012 as a thing, right? And I, I would say, like, the last couple of years, maybe it's lost some of its luster. It's lost the fear that the wide receivers used to have across the league. Um, you know, um, Going into the Super Bowl uh, when we beat the Broncos, I remember smack talking with my boss, who was a big Broncos fan. He's like, yeah, Peyton Manning and the offense, blah, blah, blah. And I said, but who is he going to throw it to? Nobody's going to be open. <laughs> now, tonight, obviously, it wasn't that nobody was open. I mean, they made some yardage. But it was never – this was never going to be a, a team that gave up a big play. This is never a team that you were going to be able to – just pick apart the Seahawks and move the, the chains and move the ball down the field and go get get your points. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, and I, I think that they found the right balance on schematically, uh, but also just the, the tenacity on their winning one-on-one -on -one matchups against wide receivers was there. Robert? Yeah, I, I, I mostly agree. Um, I actually didn't really appreciate how well um, the Rams were able to move the ball today uh in, in a lot of a lot of situations um i believe that our red zone defense really made the game for us because they they got down the field between the 20s i kind of felt like golf was 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 kind of you know as you said picking us apart um uh, uh i i think that they played made a lot of great plays in between the 20s it was between the 20 and the goal line that the seattle defense stepped up um but yeah, I still I do agree. I, we we do have the one on one matchups held down pretty good. Um, I was very um, I wasn't very high on um, uh, what's the third string corner Coleman. Uh, Coleman, uh, I saw him slip up a couple of times today. I think his open field tackling was a little weak, and that play at the very end of the game was almost him being the goat. Um, Coop, that ball just bounced right off of our cup cups uh, cups hands. That that was that was uh, that was Coleman's guy ran right by him. Um, but uh, again, goal the um, uh, red zone defense. I think for sure uh, was was our saving grace today. Yeah, uh, boy, I think I don't agree with you at all, though, Robert. Uh, I felt like Coleman has actually <clears throat> been kind of the difference that's made this pass defense step up its game. I almost feel like Jeremy Lane is a step down from him, and I've been enjoying watching it, uh, Coleman. But you are right, <clears throat> Cooper Cup did get past him. Uh, but it didn't happen on the very same play. Uh, they immediately came up to the line of scrimmage and ran the exact same play again, and the Seahawks fixed that problem. They uh, Coleman went ahead and protected uh, against Cooper Cup running the same route. Um, but I, I, it's interesting that we have a different viewpoint on that. But I want to go back to the Rams' offense. I want to go back to uh, Gurley. Gurley only had 44 rushing yards. Robert, what, what what happened to this defense where they had been gashed by the likes of Carlos Hyde and uh, of, of various uh, who's nobody of running backs? We finally came up against the best running back we've seen this year and stuffed him. A return, a return to normality is what I think it is. Uh, it, this is what I expect uh, from the Seattle Seahawks run defense. Um, what, what's been happening the last few weeks, the last couple of weeks was completely just out of character. Um, I think a lot of it has to do previously has to do with, you know, the amount of time the defense was spending on the field. Uh, but even still, um, yeah, uh, Gurley never really got going today. 
Um, and and this is this just I mean I almost I almost overlooked it. If you hadn't I mean even you know bring it up right now, it's almost something that I would overlook because I, I find it to be so normal. This is how we're supposed to play run defense. Um, so uh, yeah, but for me, it's just a return to normality. This is this is what I expect from the Seahawks D. All right, Rich. Um, I'm going to slightly disagree with Robert. Um, since Pete Carroll took over this team, historically, the first quarter of the season, meaning the first four regular season games, um, the run defense has been suspect sometimes, some of those years. They've been gashed uh, a number of times by nobodies, basically, giving up 100 yards, 150 yards, 200 yards. And then something happens that second quarter of the season, about game five. What game is it, guys? It's game five. Well, it I, game I, don't, five. I don't think Robert was disagreeing with you there. I, no, I, no, no. But I'm just saying, like, this is a historic thing that the Seahawks do the first quarter of the season. Right. They get gashed by is, no name running back. And Robert said it's a return to normalcy. Like, it, this is normal, isn't it? <laughs> well, I guess that is. I mean, it's it's a type, it's a pattern, it's a normal. But I, I, I say, for whatever reason, I don't know why the, the Seahawks have this problem. But for whatever reason, I guess the, the, the nuances of the cover three or whatever uh, make it susceptible to getting gashed until they figure their stuff out. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't expect a- anyone to run for 100 yards on them the rest of the season. Nice. End of story. I would like to see that. And I don't think we're going to see that against the Giants. So uh, at least we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll have a couple of good weeks here. All right, guys, I want to flip to the other side of the coin. I want to look at the offense here. Russell Wilson in my opinion, looked a little bit off. His passes were high, low, off to the side, and he only had 198 passing yards, uh, and he had one interception. Am I panicking, Richard? Am I panicking about Russell Wilson not looking good? Um, I think you panic every time Russell Wilson doesn't look good. Um, And and here's the thing. You're going to panic because he doesn't have Marshawn Lynch in the backfield with him. And that's okay. I mean, because... That's how we got to know Russell Wilson was with the security blanket of Marshawn Lynch in the back. But we knew that if Wilson was off, he could just hand it off to the Hall of Famer who would run the ball down the enemy's throat. He doesn't have that anymore. And so the Bill offense is much more geared around him. Obviously, we're a little more susceptible to hit the ups and downs. But Russell Wilson has shown that he is very consistent. He almost always bounces back. And, I mean, he's on track. Were historic numbers that nobody wants to talk about. Um, and we'll just see, kind of see how things go. Well, Richard, I don't, <laughs> I don't think you can just bandy about the name of Marshawn Lynch and make me feel better. Robert, make <laughs> me feel better. I mean, I'm not seeing a top flight quarterback here. No, I think I'm more. I think I feel uh, a little more uh, like you, Abe, uh, than Richard. I think. Um, because I get nervous too. I think it's a I think it's a healthy nervous, um, but I get nervous. Uh, you know, Russell Wilson has looked off, and it's not so much that he's looking off. It's it's it that he looks off at times where he shouldn't, and I, obviously he never should. But I mean, times where he has time in the pocket, or when he's when there's no one really on his neck, and he overthrows or underthrows or throws a ball out high. Um, he missed Jimmy Graham wide open uh, yeah. down down deep in the the. Uh, um, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles side of the field uh, earlier today. If he had just seen him, he ended up throwing the ball to Jimmy Graham, but he saw him so late that when Graham finally got the ball, there was nowhere for him to go. Um, you know, I, I think he throws a lot of passes that are coming out high, where the receiver, if the ball comes, you know, gets to his hands faster, he can make a move and get more yards down the field. I just see him just just, just a smidge off, but he always corrects it. He always gets right by the end of the game. It's just he, I see things from him. That just I'm like, oh, Russell, come on, let, let's dial that. In. I think I think Russell, I like to see Russell dial it in just a little bit more. But on the whole, I mean, I'm not even mad at him. Let's talk about Graham. Let's talk about Jimmy Graham. Uh, six Congrats. receptions, 37 yards, one TD. Uh, Robert, is this is this the Jimmy Graham you want, or do you expect more? I expect more. I expect so much more from Jimmy Graham. And 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 maybe I am just being too hard on the guy, but I just don't see it from him now what it is can i put it to words maybe not but i just don't see it from so, jimmy so graham the it, i see I the see, it are not statistics then for you the it no they're not the, the, the touchdown i don't even care i have to see i need to see so much more from jimmy graham before i'm going to get high on him 
that he he may not ever get there as far as I'm concerned. I need to see so much more from him because I've seen so little up until this point. I, when the ball is in his hands, he looks he's he looks slow. And I know he's a big guy, but I just I saw Jimmy Graham get laid out by a cornerback earlier today. Yeah, he, he, yeah. he was he was a yard short of the, of the line to gain. and He got laid out by a corner. And Jimmy Graham is a gigantic man. And then I, I know this is football and maybe the guy just squared him up and hit him good. But I'm like, Jimmy, get the first down. <laughs> you know, if you get a head of steam and put your head down, no corner should be able to stop you. So, yeah, um, uh, you know, it, it's the, I, didn't, I don't I like saw, it. I remember that same play. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember the corner's name, but he definitely looked half the size. Richard, um, are you when you look at Jimmy Graham, uh, let's throw those let's throw those uh, statistics out the window like we were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard, are you finding a person with no heart? Are you finding a person who has undiscovered injuries or are you finding a person that may just be old? Um, I'm finding a person who has Jeff Cirillo syndrome. Okay. We got we had a soccer metaphor. We're going for a ba baseball metaphor. Yeah, he has Jeff former Cirillo third baseman, syndrome. Third baseman. Basically, yep. he, he came to Seattle. He forgot how to play football. Or maybe, just maybe, Drew Brees is a hell of a lot better of a quarterback than we ever give him credit for because he made Jimmy Graham look almost as good as Rob Gronkowski all those years down in New Orleans. And has he ever flashed that brilliance here? No. Now, Russell Wilson, can he sling the ball? Sure. Is he as good as Drew Brees? No, probably not. But is he, like, eons worse than Drew Brees? No. The other thing to think of is that maybe Drew Brees and Jimmy Graham just had that connection. They had it that uh, Rob was talking about. And Russell and Jimmy just can't get on the same page. It's been, what, three years now? Almost, is it four? Three? Four? I don't know. But all I can say is that he is untapped potential. I wish we had our center back. Yeah. yeah. What, what, what if What if Robert, what if Sean Payton's just a better offensive coordinator or better offensive mind than Daryl Bevel? Huh? Uh, I, well, he, he's here to go with Daryl Bevel again. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I, I suppose that could be, you know what, that could be, because I know that our scheme is different than, than obviously what they had down there in, uh, in, uh, in New Orleans. Um, I, personally, I'd like to see Jimmy Graham split out wide a lot more than, than, uh, than he is. Yeah, um, we don't I, do that I, at I all, would, do we? They, we just, we just don't do it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, when it comes to when the play is, when the ball is in motion, and Jimmy Graham is out there. It is it's it's one of one of the other. Look, Jimmy Graham is either not getting open, or Jimmy Grant or Russell Wilson's not seeing him. And Russell Wilson seems to see everybody else just, <laughs> just fine. Just, just fine. <laughs> you know, he, he completed the ball to eight different receivers last last week. Um, he he's seeing all the receivers just like he needs to. Um, you know, for the most part. So I I, I just think for for what we're getting out of Jimmy Graham. I agree with Rich. Uh, I would rather have Max Unger back, and Luke Wilson could give us just as much uh, production as uh, Jimmy Graham has, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I'm getting tired of talking about Jimmy Graham every week. I would like to move on to another topic that I get tired of talking about every week, and that's this rushing game. We had 241 total yards in the game, so that's not great. And when you take it and break it down to 62 of those being on the ground, that's not great. Um, Thomas Rawls and Eddie Lacy had a lot of carries, Richard. They had a lot of carries. They didn't produce. Nope. All right. That's been decided. Thank I you. I mean, like, that's <laughs> that, no, they didn't produce. I mean, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's that the running backs are tentative and or just suck at hitting the hole. I don't know if the running backs have no vision, so they can't ever break anything. I don't understand. Is it is it a scheme thing where the line just, they just can't block? And so then there's no never any room to run. Regardless of what it is, because, you know, those things kind of mesh together. They, they can create, uh, you know, something that's greater than the sum of its parts or lesser than the sum of its parts. But, I mean, we've seen Eddie Lacy run the ball effectively in this league. We've seen Thomas Rawls run the ball effectively in this league. Heck, we've seen Russell Wilson run the ball really effectively in this league. Makes me think maybe it's not the skill positions guy's issue. And I don't want to beat the drum of this offensive line, but, I mean, you got to be able to run the ball at least some. And this, ah, is, this is becoming a broken record. 
You do, I bet, Richard, how much of this do you put against Robert Quinn, uh, Alex Ogletree, Alec Ogletree, and um, Aaron Donald? I mean, that defensive line and that, you know, front seven is mighty powerful, yeah. mighty powerful. How much of this do you put against that? You know, it, you know, a lot of it. Uh, the Rams, for whatever reason, seem to be able to stop our running game, um, you know, better than a lot of teams, even going back into the Marshawn Lynch era. So th there's some of that. Here's the thing. I don't know that I'm willing to give them a pass because of how systemically bad the running attack has been the last three years. So in a vacuum, it's the Rams. They always play us tough. They always stop the run really well. Okay, we'll, we'll give the offense a pass. Over the course of the last three years, the offensive line and the running game have sucked. No, I'm not going to give you a pass. So, I mean, and and those guys on the, the Rams defense, they they brought it. I mean, they were really good at stopping the run. They were committed, and they were daring the Seahawks to throw the ball over the top, which we didn't really ever do. Robert, I don't have Walter Jones. I don't have Blair Bush. Uh, you know, I don't have Steve Hutchinson just waiting in the wings for you. How would you fix this running game? I've been saying it for now five weeks. Um, well, four weeks because I didn't decide it until after week one. Um, we need to switch it up. I think we did a really good job. Like I thought maybe Daryl Bevel and Pete Carroll watched the show last week uh, because uh, go, in going into going into um, the uh, uh, Indianapolis game, I should say they showed two weeks ago because the uh, Indianapolis game, I saw more of a West Coast style offense. We had a, we had a rhythm in the passing game. That 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 softened up the box, and then the running game worked. Is is you know that that's what I feel the Seahawks need to do with their offensive philosophy. Um, we do not have the same team we had when Marshawn Lynch was running people running people over and running right by people like we did um, for all those years. It's just not the same anymore. Um, I think you split you, you, you get three wide receivers, single back formation, and throw the ball till they till they till they're not stacking the box. And then you run the draw, you run the you run the read option, you run the you run the the, the zone run, and, and you'll get you get start to get yards. And when you get them, you get them going back and forth. That's when we're going to find the play action working and things like that. Um, but I, I continue to see like today I was very upset early in the game uh, because I see us running the ball on first down for nothing, and running the ball on second down for nothing, and third down Russell Wilson drops back. He's got people in his face already. He's he's tilt the whirling and twirling and twirling and whirling and maybe he gets completes the ball for the first down. Maybe he doesn't, you know. And yeah. um, and and I it just it was like we went right back to it and it was it was making me crazy. Um, I, I would I would like to see us moving forward get right back to that same type of formula that we use against Indy. You've converted me actually, uh, and I got a chance to go see that game last week, uh, in person, and I'm. I'm very much of the, I'm very much of the impression we have to decide that we're a pass first team, that the pass sets up the run, like you're stating, uh, that old Bill Walsh, Bill Walshian uh, theology, and right. I, I think it could work. Now, the old West Coast offense, Richard, the old West Coast mm -hmm. offense, still had capable running backs in it at least the offenses that worked well. You're talking about your mm -hmm. Cincinnati Bengals. You're talking about your uh, uh, San Francisco 49ers, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. If we switch to a pass-first offense, Richard, if we move to a uh, dink and dunk and then set up uh, set up the run, could that work with this team? Because I didn't see it today. Yeah. I, I, I saw Robert yeah. was talking about last week. There was a lot more short yardage uh, game in the past. Today it seemed like it was all long bombs, and we ended up uh, getting stuck in, you know, uh, stuck in the mud. Well, here's the thing: it, the, the number one theoretical difference for the West Coast offense is this: you have to have balance. Okay, it's it's not just zinc and dunk. It's not just throw the ball deep to Jerry Rice. It's not right. just run the ball with Tom Rathman and Roger Craig. I mean, that's 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 what we all envision in our mind, but. Really, the West Coast offense was about balance. It was about getting the ball to your best players in the best position for them. Okay? And if that meant draw plays to Tom Rathman and swing passes to Roger Craig, great. If the next week it was it was power, you know, you know, 44 power right up the gut, that's what they were gonna do. They were flexible. And we've got a quarterback that I think is smart enough, experienced enough. And flexible enough 
that we can go week to week and make some changes. I would totally agree with Robert. You get points out of the passing game early, and then you run the ball down their throat late. Exactly. I mean, this is, this is, this is um, guess what? This is what we did with Marshawn Lynch. We did not usually just run the ball in all first quarter. Uh-uh. We did run the ball a few times with him, but usually play action, Russell Wilson over the top to City Mice or somebody else running onto it. We spread the field. We kept them honest. And we had balance in the offense, meaning we passed enough and ran enough to keep the defense honest. We threw it outside. We threw it inside. We ran it inside. We ran it outside. We went deep. We went short. We went medium. They didn't know what was going to hit them. And then we could do whatever we wanted. Oh, this cool. defense, or this offense is too predictable. I can tell you when we're going to run the ball. And I can tell you where it's going. And I'm a fan. Yeah. That's a problem. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Very passionate on your West Coast offense, sir, Rich. It's almost yes, as if, I am. It's almost as if you were uh, indoctrinated into that culture. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the long story out there, viewers. Uh, but the <laughs> I, I want to ask the big question here. The big question. These are all little questions that I've been asking. I want to know: Are the Seattle Seahawks still the reigning NFC West champs, Robert? When I say reigning NFC West champs, we saw an L.A. Rams team that was on the precipice of going 4-1. and one. Didn't, wasn't, wasn't, It wasn't pretty. It was a very ugly game. But we prevented them from going 4-1. and one. Uh, Well, I'm always of the, uh, of the opinion that you, you have to knock the king off the throne before you can, you know, take over. So I don't care if we, if we were 1-4 going into this game. Uh, the Rams aren't taking over anything until until they clinch that division, you know, later on this year or whenever they end up clinching it. So um, but to answer your question, yes, absolutely. Um, I haven't seen I mean, it's it seems pretty obvious that the 49ers aren't doing anything this year. Um, the Cardinals got their tail end handed to them today by Philadelphia. And uh, we went ahead and I think had a I think it was a convincing win, although it wasn't cute. It was a convincing win over over the Rams today. Uh, when you take when you take the you know the the highest scoring uh, offense in the league through four weeks and you hold them to ten points, that means something. Um, so that's that. I think that's that. I think we made a statement with this win today. So for sure, we are still you know holding the torch as far as uh, as far as the NFC West is concerned. Richard, do you believe in statement wins? Um, sometimes. Was this um, was this one of those times? Eh, maybe. I mean, it showed toughness. It showed resolve. It showed that, that the Rams offense can be stopped. So in, in that regard, it, it was. Um, but to me, a statement win is, um, you know, when you go out there and you remove all doubt that you are better than the other team. It's Marshawn Lynch diving into the, uh, into the end zone against the Cardinals, um, holding a body part that shall remain nameless. Okay. It's, um, you know, it's remember the Titans where you, you know, you have the coach yelling, you blitz every down, you don't let them cross the line of scrimmage, you remove all doubt. That that's a statement win for me. Okay. Um, so you think this is more of a survival? Last week, this is more last of a survival week when win? we blew out the Colts in the fourth quarter. That was a statement win. That was we're going to go and we're going to put our foot on their throat and and stomp on them. Um, this 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 was a hard fought win. I mean, let's be honest. It's it's one pick six away from. Us having an entirely opposite conversation tonight. It's a Cooper Cup uh, missed uh, missed touchdown too. I mean, that's yeah, yeah that's, that's what I was going to say. That, <laughs> that that one that Mr. Coleman that we you know, whiffed on. That's the one. That's yeah. the one. Cooper Cup. If that if that ball just comes a little bit lighter into Cup's hands, that's a touchdown. And, we're, and like you said, we're having a different conversation. Yeah, Greg Zerline could have made that field goal. I mean, there, there's a lot of <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of different things. I mean, and he doesn't miss field goals. That's that's. Uh, is yeah. Zerline still playing? I can't believe. How old is that guy? Like 55? I don't know. I think he's probably related to the Zendejas brothers. So that's how long oh, he's been playing. Yeah, yeah. That's how long he's been playing. Um, well, what does this mean for the Rams? I mean, the Rams are now 3-2. and two. They're tied atop the NFC West with the Seahawks. They, they still have a lot of momentum, right? I mean, this doesn't kill their momentum for the rest of the season. Robert, will the Rams bounce back from this? Or is this gut check time for them well i think well let me just go ahead and correct you because i don't i don't i don't like the whole tie business 
uh, Seattle is leading the division now because with the tiebreaker, we do have the number one spot. Just want to clarify that. But uh, <laughs> but um, uh, <laughs> the uh, the Rams, I think um, it's going to be showtime for them now. And what I mean by that is the league is a copycat league. And I think, you know, people are going to look, OK, how did Seattle hold the highest scoring offense in the league to 10 points? And now people are going are gonna to try to attack the Rams the way that we did. And let's see if they can go ahead and get back to what they were doing for the first four weeks of the season or not. This, this is going to be, tell us how real the Rams are, how they're going to push through this adversity. They, they finally you know, got, got shut down. Um, so let's see what they're going to be able to do moving forward. Are, are, are they going to just get beat the same way for the rest of the season? Or are they going to continue to you know, do what they were doing earlier this year? So um, I think it's just showtime for them now. It's time to put up or shut up for the Rams. So there's, uh, Robert, there's a lot of uh, 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 tape on them, basically, is what you're stating. stating. Uh, there, We've now seen what the new look Rams, the Sean McVay Rams look like. Uh, and teams like, good teams, like the Seahawks, find, out, find a way to beat them. Is that what you're stating? For sure, for sure. I mean, yeah, there. I mean, every team in the league that that has the Rams on their schedule and and even otherwise are going to study what we did to the Rams, um, and uh, and they're going to use take from that what they will and and use that and use that uh, <laughs> uh, for themselves. So, um, you know, are the Rams going to be able to persevere through that? That's the question. Richard, I want to see some. I want to. I want to hear from you some precognition as far as what the Rams are going to do through the rest of the season. Make your pick right now, Richard. Tell me what they're going to do when it comes week 16. Where They'll they be, be a wild card. They'll be 10 and 6. Um, but they're going to they're gonna lose next week because they got the crap beat out of them by the Seahawks. Okay. It's a pattern in the NFL going... Um, now, I don't mean like we beat them handily. I mean like we physically... Our, specifically, our defense beat up on their offense, okay? This is a pattern in the last few years. You play the Seahawks, you lose the next week because the Seahawks are that physical of a team. So that's my prediction. Rams go 10-6, and six, they lose next week. But you do believe it, you do believe in them in their long-term success then? I think that uh, between the, the, the other uh, two teams in the conference, the Niners, who are horrible, we'll get to them in a second, and the Cardinals, I think, are just dramatically mediocre. I think the Rams have um, better quarterback play than either of those two teams. And so I think that that's, you know, the, the difference. So I think they'll rally. I think they'll get some of the magic they have the first uh, four weeks of the season back. But I think they're going to go through this little uh, uh, early, early season, mid-season slump. Yeah, I think that this is a turning point for the Rams. It's up to them to decide where they want to turn it. Do they want to go down this path or that path, the path to glory or the path to failure? Um, I don't see any mediocrity in them. I find a team like this, a young team like this, a uh, young coach like this, it either goes downhill from here or they learn and they they pro, uh, uh, progress. And I think I agree with you, Rich. I think maybe a, a maybe a good 10 win season is in this is in the cards for them. Speaking of the cards, those Arizona Cardinals uh, were drilled by the Eagles by a score of 34 to 7. Uh, I got a chance to watch them over breakfast this morning, and uh, as much as I hate the Cardinals, watching this game almost made me regurgitate my breakfast. Richard, this, mm-hmm. was, this, this Cardinals team is old. They have Chris Johnson, yeah. Larry Fitzgerald, Carson Palmer, it's old. How, how did they expect to go into this season and think they were going to carry any magic forward? I don't know. Um, you know, there's a there's a, a theory in, in in building a team that is far better to cut a player that you think is getting old a season early rather than a season late. Well, you're seeing a whole bunch of season lates happening all at once, and you know you have a problem when here a quick quick think of Cardinals. That's right. You just named the two of them, Carson Palmer and Larry Fitzgerald. Both of those guys are what like 35. Larry Fitzgerald is their best player by far. He's supposed to be like the third receiver, the fourth receiver, but he's not. He's like the, still the go-to guy. They have a fundamental systemic problem. They haven't recouped the talent. And, um, you know, when they had that magical season, uh, you know, you know, what was it, a couple of years ago, um, you know, they tried to bottle that magic one, one time too many. Uh, Robert? I don't know if you saw any of this game. Uh, I when I was watching it, 
I just sat there thinking that everybody looked like they were wearing 20 pound shoes, 20 pounds on each foot. I, it, was, it was lead boots is basically what I saw. Yeah, I, I watched um, uh, the first part of this game today, and yeah, it was it was um, it was ugly. I mean, I think uh, Philly scored twenty one in the first quarter, right? Like it was, it was. Um, I was actually surprised. I mean, I, I've always said that the that the Cardinals weren't real, even as you know when they had that you know they were little, they were successful for the last few years. Um, I said that they weren't real; they weren't all the way real. Um, and then today they went out there and just laid an egg. I think. Uh, I think they had them like 20 or 30. I don't know. Chris Johnson didn't do anything running the ball today. Um, Carson Palmer um, threw the ball like close to 50 times, 45 times, or something like that. Um, it was it was just an ugly game all around for the Cardinals, and and it made Philly look like they might be you know <laughs> some contenders moving moving down the line. So yeah, the Cardinals. I mean, I can't say I feel sorry for them. I'm 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 happy to see it. You know, because I watch all these, I watch all of our divisions. Uh, every every week I watch our division um, uh, our division rivals play before the Seahawks play, and uh, I'm rooting against them every time. So I'm not I'm not sad about it, but it was it was pretty ugly. Like you said, it was cringeworthy. I did not enjoy watching that game. I didn't have another game to flip the channel to. Uh, <laughs> maybe someday I'll buy the NFL ticket so I can not have to you suffer. Gotta, this you got to get that ticket, man. It's it's <laughs> uh, it's business. I will tell you. Uh, but Robert, we saw the 49ers. Uh, they were getting pounded pretty bad. Came back tied it up, went to overtime, and eventually lost. Uh, I feel like I'm watching a 49er team, a winless 49er team, uh, try really hard, try the best of their ability. There just doesn't seem to be any talent there. The 49ers to, today um, battled back in a, in, and showed a lot of heart. But again, again, it was, it was against the Colts. Uh, I, I'm not as high as Richard was on 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 the win against the Colts last week because it was the Colts. Um, so I'm not really I mean I'm not really high on the 49ers being able to come back and almost win the game, taking it into overtime because again it was it was it was a little bit of a loser bowl if you ask me. <laughs> um, you know so uh, yeah the 49ers even if they had won today I I wouldn't be worried about them. They they've got a lot of work to do. Um, they're not going to be anything relevant I think for for quite some time. Richard, was there anything of interest that you could glean from the feckless 49ers this weekend? Well, the for, well, the feckless 49ers are are feckless. I mean, they're one of the two worst teams in the NFL, standing 0-5. Uh, they're, they're, they're headed back down the path that they were on before Jim Harbaugh came in and was their savior for three years, before ownership lost their collective minds and ran <laughs> him out bad. of town. Um, now, I'm not sad about that because, of course, I don't really like the 49ers, you know, being division rivals and all. But, um, I mean, they're they're feckless. Should they have probably beat the Colts? Maybe. Are the Colts great? Mm, no. But, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. It's hard to have an opinion on a terrible team. They're terrible. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that, part, that part we know. <laughs> <laughs> We're in agreement there. All right, guys. Uh, got to go a little. Got to go a little social consciousness here. Uh, talk a little bit about an ex Seattle Seahawk by the name of John Moffat. He uh, was best known for washing out as an offensive lineman and urinating at Bell Square Mall. Uh, but uh, th this this wonderful uh, this wonderful man who also is a uh, he re he really loves the. Uh, you know, uh, has a lot of interesting things to say. And one of the more interesting things he said uh, was in defense of Cam Newton. Cam Newton, as you might remember, uh, last week made an offhand remark uh, about a female reporter uh, who asked him a question about football. Uh, John Moffat, I won't go into the whole thing. You guys can look it up on the internet. But I just want to get the bullet points here for you. Uh, stated that women don't know football. Uh, most guys barely do. Uh, so stop coming into male spaces and demanding respect. Uh, and basically, uh, his commentary his commentary is that uh, women are not in; they don't perform the same job function that he did. Therefore, they don't have the same experience that he does. And it's not really wrong of Cam Newton to have the feelings that he feels, and that it's not a sexist comment at all. Um, Robert, I want to get your take 
I want to get your take on this one. All right. So let me let me channel channel myself here. Uh, Cam Newton was wrong to say what he said, but only for one reason. He was only wrong for saying what he said because he is Cam Newton, an NFL quarterback in the public eye who stands in front of a microphone after every single game and says he, he, he's the, the face and the voice of his franchise. And you can't say that sort of thing being who you are in, in, in that light. Now, when it really comes down to it, was, was what Cam Newton said wrong? Absolutely not. Because every single person on this planet knows that most chicks don't get into football that deep. And I'm talking women who even watch football. I, I have plenty of female friends who watch football, but if I start talking to them about X's and O's, I lose them right, right there in the conversation. Um, now, I know that there's are women out there that, that do dig into it, and that's great. But when Cam Newton said that it was kind of funny to hear a, a, a female talk about routes, what he was saying is that, wow, that, that's, you know, I, I, it wasn't supposed to be disrespectful. I think everybody knows that. But the court of public opinion will always take that opportunity to, 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 to attack someone in, in this sort of situation because that's their job. It's the media. The media has to have something to talk about because if there's nothing to talk about, then they don't get paid. So this is what this is. And Cam Newton needs to know better than to say those things because that's what's going to happen. But there is, there's really is nothing wrong. And John Moffat, he's absolutely right. Now he went a little bit deeper. His, his comments dug a little bit deeper. I think he was a little, a little harsh in the way he said it, um, but he's right. The, 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 um, the reporter was fed that question. She was told to ask that question. Um, and, and Cam Newton knew that. You know wait, what I wait, mean? Wait, so, do we know, do um, we know that the reporter was fed that question? Well, I, I imagine she will. We don't know that to be a fact, but okay. chances are it was. Ch chances are that that question w was was fed to the reporter. Now, and and, and maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, you know um, be, is wrong. Maybe I'm wrong for saying that. But the reality of it is this: most women, most that doesn't say to be all, but most women don't get that deep into football. That's just that's just it's an empirical fact. It's just, it's just what it is. A lot of men who call themselves football fans don't, aren't that deep into football. So just, just like, it's just like Moffat said. So um, Cam Newton was only wrong for saying what he said uh, because it was just, it was, it was insensitive only in, in terms of it being in the public light. Okay. So uh, Richard, I'll get to you in a second here. Uh, so I'm just, just asking the question here, Robert, <laughs> what, uh, uh, you know, again, uh, what if she wasn't fed that? What if that's something that she's actually trying to find out, maybe even learn about. Maybe she doesn't know. Uh, isn't there a certain, uh, isn't there a certain grace to how you treat an interview situation? It gets back to what you're saying. The whole fact about being a celebrity, uh, shouldn't you conduct yourself if this is, if this is a female reporter, it's a male refor reporter, it doesn't matter what kind of reporter it is. If they ask you the question, shouldn't you answer the question, uh, you know, as it's asked, not based off of who's asking it? Well, Again, from, a, did, from a media, he, he, from a media he, credential person, I'm talking about. Right. I mean, because because he, he did answer the question. I think, like I said, I think Cam Newton just got a little too comfortable. Um, and if you get too comfortable being who he is, they're going to get you. They're, they're always the, they, and I say they, they are who they are. They are always looking for something to talk about about you. So, so you know, it's kind of the reason I think that Marshawn Lynch just never spoke to the media. Because they're always going to look for something to talk about. She asked the question. He gave her an answer, but before he gave her an answer, he gave her an he gave her an honest side side comment like, yeah, like put like this. I was at work a couple months ago, and and an older an older uh, lady who who was from a different office from another part of the country came in, and she uh, saw my Seahawks banner on my on my on my cubicle, and she started talking to me and told me she was a um, New England Patriots fan, and. We ended up getting into a conversation about football, and she was dropping knowledge on me about the New England Patriots, and I mean, going in depth about about stats and 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 ratings and and all kind of stuff. And I was like, "Wow, like wow, like I was surprised that this lady knew football so well." So it, it's really no different than my surprise 
from this from this middle to older aged lady tell, talking deep football to me. My surprise is no different than, com than Cam Newton's comment. It's just that in that light, with that light on him, with those people, they're going to find something to talk about. It's just something to talk about. That's all it is. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the world we live in. But I, I, I feel when you're looking at a, uh, a context-driven response uh, for what was actually a black and white question, that, 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 that's a little bit confusing. And Richard, I want to jump over to you. I haven't gotten your thoughts. We only have a couple minutes left uh, about what you thought about the situation. Um, John Moffat's a fool. He did make one small <laughs> good point. Small, small. And, um, you know, he, he was talking about, you know, you can't judge people, you know, they can't play. But but in general, like in, in, a, in a small thing, oh, you know, you can't judge me. I, I play this. Well, he plays offensive linemen. I mean, how many guys in the universe play offensive line? 10,000 maybe? You know, at, at the high level, maybe college, maybe someone might get a sniff of the pros. It's a stupid point. People can judge you. People are allowed to judge you. That's that's something that can happen. And you don't have to be able to actually experience something to show empathy or thoughtfulness or kindness or intelligence. Just ask the thousands and the mil or the millions of husbands that actually are thoughtful towards their wives when they're going through, you know, childbirth and all the other stuff that comes with that. That's just one example that popped into my mind. Okay. So first of all, he's a fool. Second of all, Cam Newton, your job is half public relations. That's why you get paid the big bucks. You are an idiot. Second of all, the question that the, the, the woman reporter asked him was about one of his receivers running routes really, really well. And what you say is, yeah, he's done a great job this year in our offense. Move on. That's it. Or you can say, yeah, we've really worked hard on that or something along those lines. You don't chuckle at a reporter's question. Well, I mean, it's the, just stupid. I, I just I, do I, do? I mean, you're right. You're, you're absolutely right. Richard, you're right about that. That's what he should have done. But let's put it like this. If let's just say that a male, a male uh, reporter had asked him a question that that he that he thought was strange or funny well, let's if, say he, had the given that, if he had given that side comment first and then wouldn't answer the question no one would bat an eye but Ro robert it's, say it's, robert say <laughs> the same okay let's just say that same situation occurred there's a male reporter asked about the route running exactly the same phraseology according to john moffat here most guys barely understand football as well um does does cam newton respond in the same way or does he give the bs answer that rich well, is rich is talking about I, I don't know, but let me ask you this. Let me answer your question with a question here. If that had happened, that, that situation, as you just put it, uh, were to happen, and he had said, God, it's really funny hearing a reporter talk about routes, would, we, would there be in the same outrage? Uh, see, I don't think he would ever say that. But, I mean, this is all hypothetical, and it's really It's making, all hypothetical. Oh, uh, it's making me angry, and we're at 9 o'clock, and what I'd really like to do is just <laughs> beat, berate and beat down both of you guys because I'm right and you guys are wrong. Uh, but this is the Seattle Sports Union, and we're allowed to be right and wrong. Uh, this is uh, this this is our uh, fifth show, and we're going to do a show every week at eight o'clock on Sundays. Check us out on Facebook Live. Check us out on YouTube. Also, Robert, I'm going to give you a quick plug for your podcast. Could you give the viewers out there the name of that name of that show? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Check me out on the, on my 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 podcast. I upload to YouTube. I usually get it out by Wednesday or Thursday of the week. Um, I'll try to get it out sooner. But uh, yeah, look me up on YouTube. Uh, you can search Rob English Seahawks or uh, Rob underscore English thirteen on YouTube. If you just if you just search Rob English Seahawks, I'll be the first one in the, in the search results. Um, check me out every week uh, from my podcast. Um, I'll give my insight. And I won't have these yahoos trying to tell me that I'm wrong on it. Um, so, uh, yeah, oh, check no, we're me just out gonna, every We're week. just going to tell you that you're wrong in the comments section. Don't worry <laughs> right. about it. Uh, or text message. Uh, but, yeah, also check us out, seattlesportsunion.com, for all our great articles. Also check us out on Twitter, at SeattleSportsU. And Bob's waving at me to get the show wrapped up. Have a good night, everybody. From Richard Michelson, from Robert English, and myself, Abraham Deweese. We'll see you all next week. Go Hawks. Go Hawks.